Welcome to Tech Transformation with CGT and RAS News, where we explore the innovative tech strategies and trends in retail and consumer goods. I'm Lisa Johnson, the Editor-in-Chief of CGT. In this episode, I'm talking with Tiffany Pegues, Director of Social Search and CRM at Church & Dwight. But Church & Dwight is a consumer goods company that owns such brands as Arm & Hammer, Trojan, and Hero Mighty Patch. And Tiffany's here to tell us about what it's like innovating in social media at a 100-year-old company. So Tiffany, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be a part of this. Oh, I love having you here. I'm going to talk a little bit in a bit about just how you and I first met um, and why we decided to do this episode. Um, but for now, can you uh, get us started by telling us just a little bit about yourself and about Church and Dwight? Yeah, so Church and Dwight, as you mentioned, is a hundred plus year old company. It's actually 175 years old. So oh, wow. there's a lot of, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of rich history and a rich legacy. I think of myself as kind of a shepherd of that. And what's interesting is that I think like many companies, and especially in CPG, we sit at this intersection of, you know, what got us here won't get us there kind of mentality because there's so much disruption happening from a digital perspective at this day and age of where we sit. So it's kind of almost we're at the crossroads of deciding um, what sort of digital innovators we want to be or not to be. And so that's where I come in with the new digital growth team as a member of this team, which was formed in early February of this year. Exciting to be part of a new team, I'm sure. Yes. Um, okay. So you are joining us at the end of the year. You're going to be our final episode for 2022. Uh, very exciting for us, but we know Q4 is just a beast of a time for everyone. So can you talk a little bit about what's the biggest thing on your plate right now that we're tearing you away from? Oh my gosh. Well, it's always a mad dash um, to get to January, especially trying to finalize those KPIs. We try to be extremely KPI and results driven from an annual perspective um, as it relates to social. So I'm really proud of the work we've done to lean into lots of different tests and learns so that we're completely crushing those goals. But of course, you kind of set those stretch goals for yourself. So um, as we think about kind of the final few weeks of the year, it's about kind of completing many of those tests that we're currently engaged in. So where are you hoping to be a year from now? You know, if we did a follow up episode in next next year. Yeah. So the biggest thing for me um, that keeps me up at night is this idea of social commerce. We're a global company. So we have many counterparts and colleagues in Asia and they are completely crushing it. They'll tell you things like, oh, we sold through like six weeks of supply in one live stream. And you're like, what? How is that possible? How do, you even, like, how do you keep up with that? What? Yeah. And so um, I have a partner who always says comparison is the thief of joy, but you can't help to compare yourself. I know we're completely different markets with con completely different consumer mentalities, but um, kind of the kind of prize for me a year from now is that we've capitalized and figured out how to gain our fair share of that $17 billion live stream market. So live streaming, that's a huge priority yes. for you. For that's live stream social commerce, I'd say more grandly, um, but how we're working through it is those tests and learns where we can really show how much of um, sales are socially and just digitally influenced. Okay. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about how we first met. You were a speaker at the Consumer Goods Sales and Marketing Summit, um, which is CGT's event for sales and marketing leaders. Uh, this year's event was held in New York in the fall. And you were wonderful because we were originally going to have someone else speak on the panel and that person unfortunately couldn't join, but they said they have this wonderful person who's agreed to fill in. And I, when I say it was short notice, I mean, it was really yeah. short notice. <laughs> Yeah, like a few it days. Was, yeah, it was like a few days before the event. And so you and I met and, it, you know, it's just, we said, great, this is wonderful. Um, and then when you were on the panel, you know, you were just, you, it was really wonderful having you there. Um, and you were there to talk about uh, the future of social media within consumer goods. And you discussed one of the things I thought that was really interesting was staying relevant uh, for the next generation. And so that's certainly something that's top of mind for all consumer goods companies. But I would love the perspective from Church and Dwight because it's been around for such a long time. So I'd love for you to kind of share what you talked about here, um, the importance of staying relevant for the next generation and, and how you do this. 
Yeah, so what's fascinating is maybe a year ago, if I rewind, a lot of the conversations we were having were about the funnel and, you know, we want to do this media to reach this consumer on this part of the journey. And that's for this other part of the journey. But, you know, as we started to dabble in more and more kind of new emerging vehicles, especially TikTok, what we learned is that the funnel has completely collapsed. And if it's relevant to consumers from an awareness perspective, it will also be just as likely to help them um, consider your product and go to store. Think about the hashtag TikTok made me buy it phenomenon in particular. So this is where I think for us, it's really thinking about the consumer and how to reach them just generally and um, have a message that's motivating and authentic. So I always say video is queen because that's my key takeaway is that irregardless on what platform you're on, really these um, quick, short videos that come from this place of authenticity, often sometimes they bring a humorous light to things that is unexpected is really what I found is the secret sauce, quote unquote. So I'm sharing a secret um, with you all in order to reach consumers, especially those younger emerging Gen Z and young millennial consumers. Gen Zennials is what someone told me. Uh, we talk a lot on tech transformation about the need to get uh, leadership buy-in. And we know this is difficult across all segments of business. Uh, but I have a suspicion that it might be particularly challenging when you work in social media. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we <laughs> I see you raising your eyebrows like you might you might agree with that. So I can you talk a little bit about this? Why is it so difficult um, to still maybe prove the ROI of social media at this time and get leadership buy in? And, you know, can you talk about how you've had success in doing so? Yeah, so I'll start with kind of um, a contrast. So I started my career at a big Fortune 500 CPG Um, and what was interesting, I had the pleasure to work on one of those legacy brands where, um, there's kind of the brand logo is in the hallways and people have t-shirts with that. And one of the things I really recall is that there was so much focus and attention on some things like even packaging as an example, because, um, it occurred to me at one point as I'm sitting through a meeting with our executive team that every single executive has worked on this brand. So they all have a point of view. They all have like a rich legacy that they're trying to uphold with that particular brand. And so the reason why I mention this is because social media is the complete opposite. Where <laughs> so That's maybe, a lot of baggage for a brand. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, a lot of baggage, but it also presents like an opportunity for, you know, guidance and you can have like a deep conversation that's steeped in kind of facts versus um, social is very different in that most of the senior executives of Fortune 500, 1000, private, any kind of company, you know, they did not have social media as a marketing discipline that they, you know, really had to get smart on when they were rising through the ranks. So what that means is sometimes the conversations about social just come sometimes because there's a lack of, um, the rich history and legacy, it's just in the heart here. And it's like your, your beliefs, your personal beliefs. So I'll harken back to 2020 when we started to really explore on TikTok. And there was a lot in the news at the time, you know, given the origins of the, that platform and where consumer data is being housed. So there was a lot of fear is what I'll say, embedded in the conversations. And so for me, and this is might be a little controversial, it's always about starting small. It's about having that test case that has as few variables as possible, right? And that's oftentimes the small brand where you can measure the direct impact of something you're doing. So it's about getting the folks in the room that truly are um, really critical stakeholders beyond marketing. So it was, you know, the marketing team and the digital marketing team sitting with sales um, to really say, okay, we are launching on this platform. We want to be able to measure the impact because right now we have no other marketing levers turned on. So we think um, we can make it successful where we could showcase how, you know, our activities on this platform can really move the needle and have a measurable sales impact. 
And it was structuring a test in a very disciplined, thoughtful way. And I know that's controversial because some people want to go for that big bang and they want to go for what's splashy and sexy. They want the razzle dazzle. And I get it. I'm a marketer. I love razzle dazzle. Like, (laughs) what? Are you kidding me? Um, My glue gun is right here because I'm going to go razzle dazzle some Christmas gifts. But at the same time, it's really important to like test and learn, truly learn is the part of that. And so you can iterate to great. And sometimes I feel like you don't have that opportunity if you're focused on uh, the biggest brand in the building, because there's so much attention and there's the fear that gets involved in the conversation. And I want to be fearless, right? And so I want to work with people who are fearless. And so this is where I found success and really starting small. And then you have this amazing case study that you can get the razzle dazzle around for the biggest brand. So really, that's how I've tried to order my steps in social. And um, this sometimes can take time, but it doesn't have to. I mean, for instance, we went from maybe... Um, two brands activating consistently on the platform in 2020 to now I think it's our 15 brands are active and you know we've been successful in continuing to build on our learnings to gain a bigger percentage of the overall marketing budget to um, really focus on social that influence sales and that's been kind of the secret of showing the impact from a consumer perspective, not only on awareness, but also on consideration and then conversion. 